passing this up. Yeah, the left and right ones. Can you avoid getting those there? If you flip it around, it's three Ah, so the name is right. <laughs> So we've been hearing a lot of things about um, scenarios that are running 700 nanoseconds, you know, a few seconds, a few hundred seconds. I'm going to talk to you about scenarios that run 50,000 seconds. That's the scenario time. It actually runs about a factor of a thousand faster than that. But we're trying to run long-term things to see what happens because. We're talking about stuff that is a lot slower. So we are we are developing new protocols for for HF radio. That's two to thirty megahertz, more or less. Um, it's kind of a fun place to be in the radio spectrum. They call it high frequency. It's really to everything you know low frequency. <laughs> and and it, but the most interesting thing about it, you know, it has lots of cool things about it. But um, we'll talk to it in a second. But it has unique things as well that are a lot of fun. Uh, we're using Omnet and the INET framework specifically to simplify the process of simulation so that we can get these, these things out. We can start playing with not only the protocols we've got running now, but new ones, new things that are standards under development that we can start to solve the discussions with. You know, our simulations suggest that if we do it this way, it'll be better than if we do it that way. And there's NATO standard discussions in process right now that are kind of crucial to that sort of, sort of work. This is a really short list. I had a much, much bigger one. <laughs> but uh, the, the really cool thing about HF is Skywave. The fact that you can have a radio and another radio hundreds, thousands of miles away, and they can communicate directly. No intervening stations, no satellites, no infrastructure, just you against the ionosphere. It is, it is really quite amazing. I'm my personal best, and I'm not a ham operator, I've just done this for work, was, uh, was about 11,000 miles. I had a radio station in Rome, New York, <laughs> near my office. And uh, from there, I was able to communicate data directly to a, a radio in New Delhi, India. <laughs> so that's about 11,000 miles. It was 96 or 97 we were doing that testing, and it was, it was a good day. There are bad days on HF, but that was a good day. Um, and we were getting 1,200 bits per second. It was pretty exciting. <laughs> now, that did require directional antennas. The antenna I was using, the place I was using, I went specifically because they had an awesome antenna. And it's basically telephone poles around a cow, cow pasture with wires strung in kind of a rhombic shape uh, with an open end pointing north, northeast. And the great circle route from there runs all the way through Europe and winds up somewhere down in India. It's, it's a good long shot. The antenna on the other hand, they had taken and set up there like the week before. So it wasn't nearly as, as wonderful an antenna at the other end. But it still worked pretty darn well. So, every good thing there's a bad thing and there's more bad things than you can imagine the data rates as i said are not wonderful at all we get up to 9600 bits per second now that takes a fabulous kind of a link um, we're working on wideband this is all all the up to 9600 is in three kilohertz bandwidth and we're we're working on wideband hf now that will go up to 24 kilohertz bandwidth you'll be able to get probably the corresponding X8 data range. So you're talking on the order of 800 kilobytes per, or kilobits per second. Uh, it's, it's never going to be great, but it's got these other features that are fun. It's got really high error rates, you get a lot of interference. The errors are really funny because they happen in bursts. It's not just a statistical bit error rate thing. They happen and you'll lose a whole bunch in a row. Forward error correcting codes, I hate that. Um, you get these multi-mode fades where you'll have you know, you'll have a fading pattern of around two seconds overlaid with a fading pattern of around a half second overlaid with a fading pattern of about a minute 
and you can hear this this complex fade in out as you listen to the the modems go and it's really quite interesting except when it messes you up <laughs> um, the flip side of round the world communications is of course you can hear everybody or at least within that band so you get interference from everybody else who's trying to use that channel regardless of where they are in the world it's not like you know a taxi where you've got a radio but you can use the same frequency because you're across town and you don't interfere no it doesn't work that way um, and the other funny thing is that is that a lot of the time uh, only a certain portion will will propagate three to six megahertz um, so maybe you know at this particular time of day the propagation from here to New York would be I don't know eight to twelve megahertz uh, overnight it might be three to seven or so something like along that and it fades and moves around over over time over the course of the day because it's all based on the ionosphere and your solar radiation and a hundred other factors but what that means then is that everybody gets crowded into that space that's working so it's it's even even more fun than that I gotta shut up I will talk about that until you are so tired of it I've been working HF I'm a software guy but I've been working for an HF company for more than 30 years and it's just I learn new things every time I start playing with it. It, is, it has just been a blast. So we'll move on. <laughs> um, simulation advantages, I'm sure a lot of these are simpler, but you know, things are more, again, there's, there's variations. Um, because we're dealing with low data rates, because we're dealing with highly variable circumstances, we need to run very long scenarios in order to make sure that we capture a representative set of information. Um, right just takes a long time. So none of these things are really unique to HF, but they're just more so. Um, repeatability has been a huge thing for us because when we go out and do field tests, they'll come back and they'll say, it didn't work at this particular time. Well, what was going on? We don't know. And you'll hunt through the logs and try and figure out what went wrong and you'll get information, but never enough. And you've got to make educated guesses and go out and try again with changes. And then that particular circumstance doesn't happen again. It may not happen again for another five tries of going out and testing. The repeatability of the, the simulation scenarios means if I see something I don't understand, I can instrument that piece of the code, make a guess about what's wrong, instrument it, run the same scenario again, get the same error again, and fix it. I love that. Um, also, the simulation lets me introduce, in, instrument the whole network. So I've got extra stuff coming out of TCP telling me what he thinks is happening in the world. And that's also really useful because I can use that to figure out how to make things work better. I think I jumped ahead accidentally. I must be fidgeting with this. No, I didn't. I, didn't. I don't know where I am. Oh, I'm right there. Where are you? So anyway, the design, we're basically wired into um, the IPv4 model of INET. Um, we're acting as, a, as, a, as an interface, just like anybody else. This traffic is routed to us. And then there are defined um, interface components that are part of, this is STANAG 5066. It's a NATO standard data link protocol for HF. So it has. Uh, ooh, yes. It has a subnet interface that basically handles the packets that, as they come in and figures out what's going on. Channel access that chooses a frequency to work on and makes sure that's maintained properly. And then there's a data transfer, a data link protocol that actually handles all the interesting work. Then we also have our own modems, of course, because you can't just use a standard modem on this. Um, and, and an HF propagation segment as well. That's basically the the RF simulation. The interesting thing is that the error simulation is up in the modem simulation because the modems we use, they do this magical thing called trellis, demodula, trellis coding demodulation. It's a, it's a multi-phase shift interpretation of the world where it means is every time you get a symbol, 
you get the next set of incoming instrumentation from the receiver and you say, well, that's probably a 90 degree phase shift. So that means the next symbol is going to be the. And so since I know where I was, the phase shift is something related to where I was. If I make a mistake, then the next time around, I am much, much more likely to make a mistake. So the errors come in these bursts. And it actually is, in some ways, it's just as much the modem making a sequence of mistakes as it is the propagation being that bad. It's still the best way to do it as far as we know, but you know, this is how these bursts of errors come on, or one of the ways they happen is this. Once you walk onto the wrong path, you tend to walk it for, for a little while until you find your way out again. So you get a bit that's unambiguous enough that you figure out where you're supposed to be. So. So that, as I said, it's not just a good statistical thing. It's not like a, you know, is this bit, the, the bit probabilities of error are not independent of each other. They are related to each other. And so the, the way we went about this was to run a, a model offline that was very computationally intensive and that does a whole lot of things. It figures out what, under certain conditions and error rates and data rates and all, what the error trace looks like. Then we went back and analyzed all that and basically separated that into, well, there are sequences where everything works. There are no error runs, and then there are sequences where things are terrible. And you get these mixed bits of errors and good, and they kind of stack end to end. So they, the guy, the other author of this paper, Eric Kosky, statistically analyzed those bit patterns and figured out how to model that stream of error and no error sequences in, in much better time. So what we're able to do is generate, we generate errors in much better than real time. <laughs> Which is exactly what we want because we really want this thing to run as fast as it can. And I think I talked ahead of slide. But the cool thing is that the, the bit error pattern does correspond to the actual traces that we'll get from the simulation and from things that we've actually measured on error. So, some fun results we got out of this as we ran it. Um, what we're seeing is the probability of connection success, zero to one. That is, I opened up a TCP socket, sent a whole bunch of data, got the fin the message back, closed up, everything was good. And you got to get all the way to the end for it to count. It doesn't do anything otherwise. And so what we see is standard TCP, somewhere around eight and change SNR, we start actually getting some results. There's a lot of variability because you get lucky, you get unlucky, a lot of that goes on. And even going farther, you see there's some outlining, I got unlucky up there and it didn't work. Um, the other thing you can do is performance enhancing proxy for TCP. There's an RFC related to this. The, the gist of the, the more interesting way of going about that is you intercept the TCP packets and fake the X. You send spoof X back to the sender saying, yeah, I delivered that, it was great. <laughs> and then you go ahead and try and send the data slowly. And hopefully you finish it before the checks you've written come to the bank. <laughs> so you wind up getting ahead of yourself, you're lying to TCP in order to keep him happy while you go ahead and negotiate the more difficult link. And everything should finish up. And in fact, you see that when you've got the, feet, the performance enhancing proxy, you're a, a bit better. And you specifically, you, the, the curve is much steeper and less variable, which means that you tend to go from I don't work to I do work relatively quickly. And then we played some games with trying to mess with, well, if we start with the performance enhancing proxy and we start messing around with stuff, can we do better? And it turns out that under certain circumstances, you can in fact get a more reliable uh, circumstance and get things to work just a little more stably and a, and a slightly lower SNR. And we're still working on exactly how, how well that actually translates into the real world. Um, and it is a proprietary thing, but it's a lot of fun. 
So I've been having a blast with this. Uh, future work, we want to add per length parameter models. We want to be able to have multiple sessions and be able to say when I transmit to that station, there's that level of performance, but when I transfer to this station, there's a different level of performance, and we can model that. Um, realistic antenna and ionospheric modeling in line, that'd be fun. Uh, improving the modem model to add more of those funny little inline variations we've got. Um, the wideband stuff that we're working to model, uh, some channel access, and, and more improvements to TCP we're hoping at. And finally, I'm here to say thanks. Really, this has been a blast. I've been working on this less than a year, and it, I, I've seen amazing things you people have done that I can get and work at. I've seen lots of online resources that are easy to get to. When I run into a hole and I don't know why something works, the information is out there. I'm, I'm just, I'm having a lot of fun. I, I'm just happy I could come here and talk to you about what I'm doing with it. And what a blast I think it is. And I think this is really good stuff. And uh, I think that's a British saying. <laughs> and you don't find that terribly often. But what it means is it does what you promised it would do. You read the website of a lot of things and you say, yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> this stuff, I just everything seems to do what it, what it suggests it's going to do. And I really kind of like that. So thank you very much. Thank you. And we have quite some time for questions. I don't know. You said that one of the most important problems was interference, probably. Are you modeling these, and uh, are you dealing with that uh, in your simulation model? Interference is one. In order to model interference, there's a certain level of, of atmospheric noise and stuff mm -hmm. that goes on that is ambient. Yeah. Um, but there's also interference from people that you know, yeah, I mean, or the, the inserted kind of signals, and that's one of the things we're going to be working on over the next couple of months, is adding in other traffic on the same link mm -hmm. and actually generating some of that interference. Um, and that will then be coherent and especially destructive. <laughs> but are you planning to, uh, in this case, you are just uh, simulating uh, uh, two peers communicating? Is At the right? moment, yes. Yeah. But when you are doing uh, the um, interference related stuff, are you planning to ju just generate fake interference or multiple peers communicating, multi multiple, multiple, uh, multiple pairs of uh, station communicating? <coughs> if they'll pay me, I want to do both. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be able to defend my stuff against myself, against our own, another traffic source on the same channel or a near channel interfering in a very constructive way with what I'm doing because it's the same waveform. And I also want to be able to plant just a random transmitter that does something. Um, I know that there were, there are existing transmissions that just live in the HF spectrum. There is a chunk of spectrum that there's just some random crud that's being transmitted all the time. And then every once in a while it will break and something coherent will go on for a few seconds or a few minutes and then it will go right back. And the, the supposition is someone has decided they want this channel all the time and so they transmit enough power that nobody else can use the channel except when they want it. And then they'll cut it off, do their little burst and put it back on. I don't know who that is. Nobody seems to really know who it is, but it's really interesting how, how long it's gone on. Um, so that's the sort of thing I want to model. I'd love to have that in there and try it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, sure, absolutely. I'm not supposed to do that. <laughs> so, no question related to, to the modeling specifically, but uh, this is really kind of very far outside anything uh, that I've been exposed to, and I would just be very interested to learn what well, actually the, the use cases in this uh, day and age are for, for this technology. <laughs> no, no, trying this no, no, you are correct. <laughs> this is a question that, that a lot of people ask. 
um, a lot of people who actually otherwise wind up buying the stuff. <laughs> um, for a good number of years in, in the mid 80s, I, I always privately estimated that we sold millions of dollars worth of equipment that no one ever wanted to use. But it became evident that, so, that satellites could be attacked. And that someone could put the money into attacking your satellites and take out your communications. And so the people who own the satellites said, if we have a credible alternative, something that will also go around the world, then they won't do that because we'll have a fallback. So they bought the HF systems as a means of defending the satellites. I don't know how much of that is actually true, but that's a possible thing. <laughs> a lot of people use it because it's simply easier. It's easier than getting satellite time. You just get a frequency and go. Um, a lot of, we, we, this, this technology is used also in a lot of places um, outside of the US where they may not have access to satellite time all the time. It's cheaper than satellite time because you don't, you pay for the electricity is really what it comes to. You don't pay for the actual access to the satellite. So that's a use case right there. Yes, the data rates are not great at all. But if that fits your need, um, then it's a very cost effective alternative. Ships at sea use it a lot, for instance, because it's it's very simple. It works reasonably well as long as you've got the right, right person running it or the right software configuring it, and uh, and it's cheap. I'm convinced. <laughs> <laughs> You're buying one. <laughs> <laughs> to play with, you know. It seems like one. one. You've got to have two. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about cow pastures earlier. <laughs> yeah. There you go. You mentioned the forward error correction yes. codes. Uh, is that part of your simulation? And if so, which ones are you using? Um, I do not know specific yeah. specifically which ones we are using. That's actually built into the modem, okay. and it's kind of companioned with the interleaving. So that uh, someone used the term earlier, and I wasn't positive everybody would know what it meant. Um, but in the HF world, I think of it as like a box and you fill the bits row by row, and then you transmit them column by column. So if you get a blast of errors, it will tend to take out one column because those are the ones that are transmitted in a row. But when you reorient, you fill the box by columns and empty it by rows, now you've got one bit every 10 or 20 or 50 that are in error. And the error correcting codes will just crunch right through that. So that's that's one of the things that we do a lot, along with the error correcting codes, to make this work, even in pretty cruddy environments. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. If you have exactly what it's easy that way, right? Quick comment on that: that uh, you, you might, it's might, it might be worth to take a look at it. In INF, we do have components for convolutional coding, for error correction, for scrambling, interleaving with polynomials, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, the 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 those uh, algorithms are impl implemented, which are used in the 802.11 standard in a, in a bit precise model. So maybe you might those components are reusable and completely independent of the 802.11. So you can just reuse the the before the error correction component or the or the <coughs> interleaving scrambling components if you want. Yeah, that's that's, that's very just a note for for the. Decoding. For reasons of computational complexity, we elected to, to move the simulation up a layer or two from that. So we've actually pre-simulated all that and are just taking the outputs up. Um, but that's that's a possible thing, I'm not sure. Uh, I am given to understand that the, in case the actual serious. implementation of the modem and all that coding is, is more computational than we want to undertake when we're trying to do reasonably fast yeah. things. And I've run scenarios that took four days, <laughs> you know, 25 runs of each setup, uh, nine data rates, and um, every tenth of a dB from minus five 
to 27. <coughs> and three different methods. So it turned out to be an awful lot of different iterations I had to run through. And I just set a 32-minute set a core machine off playing with it and went home. <laughs> Hopefully, came back to a finished simulation. <laughs> usually, <laughs> you get scared of that, and I was, but uh, but it worked well. Awesome. Okay, sorry to cut this off here, but yes. we, we should really get going with the yes. with the last talk. I do.